You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Now, my wife and I live in an old home, and the first portion was built back in 1909, and ever since it's been expanded in just about every direction, and that includes adding a second floor early on. And as with many old homes, we've had to deal with mice living in our basement, in the attic, and even in the walls, and it is really annoying. No matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't keep them out. I sealed up all the holes in the foundation, recited the house, I blocked off the attic vents, I even screened in the attic over our covered porch. Each time I thought I had sealed every single port of entry, they'd somehow find their way back inside when winter came around. You know, they wanted the warmth. But I have to tell you, no more. This is our second winter living mouse-free. That's because I finally located what I hope is the last hole. It was in the frame of our wooden basement door, and I think I finally logged them out. At least I hope I have. Probably tomorrow there'll be more mice in the house. Well, today I have a humorous story from the 1970s. It's of a mouse who evaded capture in the San Jose Police Department and became a minor celebrity at the same time. He became the subject of countless newspaper articles. People protested for his release. He had his own fan club and his character was plastered onto t-shirts. It's really just a fun story. I am Steve Silverman, and today I present to you the crazy story of Marty the Marijuana Mouse. This is the Useless Information Podcast. Useless Information In December 1974, the San Jose Police Department in California had a very big problem. It was clear that there had been an intruder in their evidence room, not just once, but multiple times. And this happened night after night for several weeks. But no matter how hard they tried, officers were unable to capture this thief. And while marijuana was his drug of choice, quantities of hashish and cocaine were also missing, all of which had been originally collected as evidence for various court cases. Evidence left at the scene of the crime was very telling. There were powdery tracks, evidence bags with holes in them, and bits of cardboard scattered all around. What was most interesting was that only very small quantities of these drugs were disappearing. The crook, he was taking just enough each night to support his addiction. Then, one day, officers caught a glimpse of the suspect. He had short hair, a small face, beady eyes, and was petite in stature. And when I say petite, I mean tiny. He measured around 3 inches or 7.6 centimeters overall. Of course, it should be clear by now that the suspect was not human. In actuality, he was a field mouse who seemed to have become addicted to marijuana. He was nicknamed Marty the Marijuana Mouse, and it wasn't long before he became a minor celebrity nationwide. Officers were doing their best to try and trap Marty, but he somehow always managed to avoid capture. Yet, just like me, they refused to give up. San Jose Police Lieutenant Arnold Bertotti told the San Francisco Examiner on December 11, 1974, quote, If we get him, we'll preserve him for posterity. After which the article concluded with a bit of humor, quote, But his diet will be strictly cheese. One week later, an expert arrived at the scene of the crime to assist in hunting down the suspect. He was Dr. Ronald Siegel, a psychopharmacology fellow at UCLA's Center for Life Sciences. Siegel's reason for getting involved was strictly for research purposes, or so he claimed. Now, Marty certainly wasn't the first rodent to have munched away on marijuana in police evidence rooms, but, as Siegel pointed out, there was, quote, evidence in his feces that Marty had been eating actual marijuana stalks in addition to his diet of seeds. What that meant to Siegel was that Marty had been exposed to the effects of THC, which is the principal psychoactive constituent of cannabis. Siegel added, phrased with that classic 1960s counterculture vibe, quote, I fly all over the world searching for animals that turn on. Man, however, is the only animal who intentionally eats psychoactive plants. Animals turn on by accident. Siegel hoped to extrapolate his findings to learn more about, quote, man's pattern and self-administration of recreational uses of marijuana and how its use affects our behavior. We'd like to take some blood samples from him to determine exactly what his diet has been. 
we want to try to find out if Ndidi has been eating these plant drugs and how much he has been eating. Now, Siegel was fairly certain that Marty wasn't walking around in a drug-induced stupor. He concluded this by observing that Marty consumed mostly the seeds and stalks of the plant. Most of the psychoactive substances, well, they're concentrated in the leaves, and Marty ate very little of them. Of course, this all sounds like legitimate scientific research, but Siegel still had one really, really big problem. That is that Marty was still on the lam. Without Marty, there was no research. On Tuesday, December 17th of 1974, narcotic officers and Siegel attempted to flush Marty out of his hiding place. They searched high and low, crawled around on the floor looking for his home. And then they spotted him. They attempted to capture him, but Marty did all that he could to avoid getting caught. He made a run for the filing cabinet, then he used a long row of cardboard boxes for cover, and he got away. According to one officer, quote, he was last seen southbound on the floor. Further searching did uncover Marty's nest. It was inside of a plastic bag filled with marijuana stalks and leaves, and Marty had used the bulk of his stash as bedding material, although traces of hashish and cocaine were also found. While they had temporarily flushed Marty out of his home, he was certain to return. And since basic traps had proven unsuccessful, it was decided to use a little sex appeal. A female mouse nicknamed Mata Harry, not Mata Hari, Mata Harry, she was brought in to attract Marty, but he resisted the temptation. Of course, no one knew if Marty was really a male or not, although I can tell you it was later determined that Mata Harry, she was a he. <laughs> well, it was time to bring in the big guns, the Shermans. Not Sherman tanks, but Sherman traps. Three of them were donated by Chabot College zoology professor Carlo Vecarelli. Now, most homeowners are unfamiliar with Sherman traps, and that's mainly because they're very costly, but they are used extensively by researchers worldwide to capture small rodents, you know, just like Marty. So let me see if I can describe them to you. Basically, they're elongated boxes, and they're made of sheet metal, and what's cool about them is they actually fold up, and you can put them in your pocket. But when you open them up, there are spring-loaded doors on both ends. So an animal, it enters into the trap, and when it gets to the center, its weight releases a latch, and of course that snaps the door closed, and the animal is entrapped without any harm to it. Officer Jim Leroy commented that if the Sherman traps didn't work, quote, we'll have to use the ultimate weapon, some type of poison. But there's been such a big deal made about this mouse that if we kill the damn thing, we're going to look worse than pigs. The December 20th, 1974 edition of the San Francisco Examiner posed the following questions. Will Marty avoid the Sherman traps? Will Mata Harry betray Marty? Will the ultimate weapon come into play? Stay tuned. Well, Tuesday's Los Angeles Times best described what happened next. Quote, It was undoubtedly the most intensive mouse hunt in the history the San Jose Police Department has ended. Marty the marijuana mouse is in custody. The elusive rodent, which for months has frustrated some of the narcotics department's best talent, as well as a mouse hunting college professor, became the unwitting victim of police entrapment over the weekend. In the end, it was not spectacular police work that did him in, but Marty's insatiable taste for good grass he found among the other goodies in the department's third floor evidence room. Ignoring no way out wire traps baited with conventional mousy tidbits, including another mouse named Mata Harry. The intrepid Marty scurried into a single trap containing marijuana seeds. Detective Leroy commented on Marty's condition, quote, Frankly, I think he was more than a little strung out. He was so nervous and frantic that he was banging his head on the top of the cage. We had to move him into a glass cage without any objects in it to keep him from hurting himself. I guess that's the uh, mouse equivalent of a rubber room. He added, Honestly, we may have to give him a little grass for a few days to bring him down slowly. Well, Christmas was just around the corner and a decision was made to spare Marty's life. They'd allow Marty to live, but he'd have to face trial for his numerous criminal offenses. And that included the possession of marijuana. In the meantime, Deputy City Manager Harold Rosen signed papers and they made Marty an official member of the city's canine corps. And Marty was well qualified for this because he was able to sniff out a stash far better than any dog could. 
Well, the hearing took place on Christmas Eve before Judge Edward Nelson. Attorneys David Bayes and Charles Kramer petitioned the judge for a writ of habeas corpus, arguing that Marty, quote, had been illegally entrapped, unlawfully confined, and denied his constitutional rights. Representing the police was attorney Royce Fincher, who argued that Marty was now in good hands and that the writ should be denied. He described Marty as having been in a deplorable condition at the time of his capture and that he only stole the marijuana to survive. But now that he was in the good hands of the police, he'd be provided with a much healthier diet of cheese and water. Mm Mm-mm, good. Well, Kramer disagreed. He argued that Marty had not chosen to become a member of the Canine Corps. Instead, he was forced into it, and he demanded that, quote, the mouse be released from his cage right here in court, and we'll see if he voluntarily joins the Canine Corps. Not only did Judge Nelson deny the writ of habeas corpus, but he dismissed all the charges against him, and after that, the officers carried Marty and his glass cage out of the courtroom. Then, on Christmas Day, the text of a teletype message from Marty appeared in the examiner. Quote, Our law finally captured, but a feared I am not, for I deceived my captors a H of a lot. During this Yule, I've been living on seeds and whatnot. Now I have a regular diet I enjoy a lot. The catch was fair, really, I'm not mad. My children could go hungry, my wife might be sad. But with welfare in the state for those in need, there will be a warmth for my family with cheer indeed. With times so tough and dear, everyone looked to me for cheer. Throughout the coming days, I wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And that teletype message was signed, Marty Mouse, by Lieutenant Arnold Bertotti of the San Jose Police Narcotics Squad. While they were all having good fun with Marty's sudden fame, his future was up in the air. That's because Marty was about to become the subject of Dr. Siegel's scientific studies. On January 13, 1975, he told the UCLA Daily Bruin, quote, When I went to pick Marty up, there were some problems. The San Jose Narcotics Squad had become very attached to Marty, and they were not at all excited about giving him up. Now, they did agree to loan Marty to Siegel for about three months, but getting him to UCLA, well, <laughs> let's just say that was a bit comical. Quote, he escaped in the men's room at the airport. I had to crawl under the stalls on my hands and knees to finally make a diving capture that even Dick Vermeil would be proud of. Little side note, Vermeil was the UCLA head football coach at that time. After he recaptured Marty in the bathroom, quote, they wouldn't let Marty on the PSA flight back to LA. The flight was held up. I didn't have the papers necessary to bring an animal on board. Finally, the flight captain granted special permission to let Marty on. But Siegel did get Marty to the lab, and he was fed a diet of laboratory chow and increasing amounts of marijuana, which just happened to be grown on a U.S. government farm down in Mississippi. But when Marty was restricted to a pure 100% marijuana diet, he preferred the seeds and stems over the leaves. Yet he did consume some of the leaves, and this resulted in him becoming more lethargic and there was a significant drop on the counter on his running wheel. While initially quiet and withdrawn, he eventually became irritable and aggressive. His head twitched frequently, and that's a sign that he was hallucinating. Marty also lost interest in breeding with his female companion, who was appropriately named Mary Jane. What else would you call the mouse? And when the lab chat was reintroduced into his diet, Marty mostly returned to his normal behavior, although the occasional head twitch suggested that he become addicted to the drug. Meanwhile, outrage over Marty's incarceration began to brew. This resulted in two women, that's Norma Rosenberg and, get this name, Lois Lane. They started the Marty Mouse Fan Club. Supposedly, they did this after Norma's son Bobby commented, quote, Look, this mouse should be a symbol of freedom. Why don't we do something about it? And that's exactly what the two women did. On January 31st, 1975, the Daily Bruin, which just happened to run advertisements for t-shirts that read Free Marty, they published an editorial commenting on a Free Marty rally that the two women had planned for later that day. Quote, With apathy and overwhelming crisis facing our nation, two women cry out. 
Their cry is for liberté, égalité, raternité, for the great universal ideal of choosing one's own fate. They squeak for Marty the Mouse. Life hasn't been very good of these days for Marty M. Mouse. Locked in an NPI slammer, that's the Neuropsychiatric Institute, locked in an NPI slammer, Marty has become more than just a harassed mouse. Marty is a symbol, a cause celebrate for everyone sweating beneath the iron hand of dictatorship and facing the fist of fascism. But the Free Marty campaign is on the march, shedding real mouse tears for its namesake. If the campaign scope is equal to the spirit and desire of its two Liberty Bells, Lois Lane and Norma Rosenberg, then every American will look inward and ask himself the vital question, what have I done to perpetrate a system where atrocities like this can happen? Today at noon in Meyerhoff Park, there will be a rally to give support to Marty. It is your conscience. Don't send Marty to the cat house. So you're probably wondering, did anyone show up? Well, in fact, they did. An estimated crowd of 150 people gathered to protest against the experiments that were being performed on Marty. And in exchange for the participation, each protester was given a free Marty bumper sticker. And after the rally was over, the fan club did not let up on its pressure campaign. A letter was penned to President Ford requesting that Marty receive a full pardon. They also asked for help from U.S. Representative Alfonso Bell, who did reply to the students by telegram. Quote, The Marty the Mouse problem is our kind of issue. I pledge to take this matter to the highest authority in Washington, just as soon as I find out who the highest authority is. Now keep in mind this is shortly after the Watergate scandal, so he added that if Marty, quote, had committed his crimes in Washington instead of San Jose, There is no doubt at all that by now, not only would he be out, he would be giving lectures around the country. Now, Marty was eventually returned to the narcotics officers in San Jose, and the press quickly forgot about him. Well, that was until October 8, 1975, and that's when reporters learned that Marty was lying listless inside of a paper cup at the police station. One officer stated, quote, He's getting old. He can't live much longer. Then, a few days later, Marty was rushed to a nearby veterinary hospital with an infection and a high fever. An unnamed narcotics officer reported that, quote, the word is he's got a hot spot, an allergy or something. He's getting old, but I don't think his death is pending. He should be back from the vet on Monday. He added, quote, we're planning to get him a toupee. The bald spot destroys his public image. He looks bad. You can imagine what a bald-headed mouse looks like. Sadly, Marty would not recover. He passed away on Tuesday, November 4th, 1975, at an estimated age of 16 months. The San Francisco Examiner published a lengthy obituary the following day. It reads, in part, quote, Funeral arrangements are being planned here today for Marty Mouse, a distinguished figure in the San Jose Police Department and in local scientific circles since last Christmas. Mr. Mouse, descendant of a pioneer family of field mice who settled in and about police headquarters here, died in his sleep yesterday at the San Jose Pet Clinic. Attendance at the end came quietly and was due to the infirmities of old age. He was taken to the clinic last October 10th, suffering from an undiagnosed ailment which caused loss of appetite and his hair to fall out. It concludes, quote, The effects of his diet of cannabis sativa were the subject of articles in several scientific journals. Mr. Mouse is believed to leave numerous children and grandchildren and innumerable nieces and nephews. Arrangements are being made for internment under a grassy knoll. Well, Marty may have been gone, but his memory lived on. You see, in January 1976, the Marty Mouse fan club, they teamed up with the manufacturers of Easy Wider Rolling Paper and they presented the first annual Marty the Marijuana Eating Mouse Memorial Awards. The recipients were then San Francisco Mayor-elect George Moscone and State Assemblyman Alan Cerotti, both of whom sought the liberalization of marijuana laws and to Representative Bell for his help in trying to free Marty. While none of the recipients were in attendance at the Los Angeles Champagne Brunch, so Club President Lois Lane stood in for each of them. Then, on March 22nd of 1976, the club presented the San Jose Police Department with a Marty Mouse statuette, 
and it just happened to have an easy wider hat on its head. The inscription read, quote, presented by the Marty Mouse Fan Club and Easy Wider to the San Jose Police Department for appreciation for its human treatment of the late Marty Mouse, born, question mark, died November 4th, 1975. Over the next few years, there'd be stories in the press of other mice that nibbled away at the marijuana stored in police evidence lockers, but none ever achieved the level of fame of Marty, the marijuana mouse. Now, I just wonder if the San Jose Police Department still has that statuette in its possession. Hmm. Useless? Useful? I'll leave that for you to decide. Well, if you listen to the last retrocast, you may recall that this episode was supposed to include a woman who was on I've Got a Secret back in 1960. Clearly, that's not what you heard. Unfortunately, something came up at the last minute, and we will be rescheduling that. And of course, I was in need of a story I could pen quickly, so I opted for this one on Marty. It's a story that I had already completed my research on a while back, so it just took a few days to write and record. But I have to tell you, I just loved how everyone involved played along with the joke. That included the police, the mock trial, the protests, his obituary, and so on. Just a fun story. Just to remind you, you can find the Useless Information Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. So make sure you subscribe. I'll place all of my contact information for the show in the show notes, plus I'll include a link to my webpage where I'll post some Marty-related images. You may want to check those out. And again, the Useless Information Podcast is now part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network, so make sure you go to airwavemedia.com, and there you'll find a curated selection of some of the best podcasts, not just in history, but also in science, wellness, education, and the arts. Take care, everyone. Bye.